Hello, everyone, and welcome to Demanufacturing Consent on BowlingFrogsPost.com. I am your host, Guillermo Jimenez. Thank you all so much for tuning in once again and downloading today's podcast. And as always, a big thanks to those of you who make this show possible by subscribing to BFP. Could not be done without you. So again, very, very much appreciate the support. Be sure and join us here every week on Demanufacturing Consent on Bowling Frogs Post. If you've missed any of our previous episodes, reminder that you can catch uh, the archives of this show on BowlingFrogsPost.com and on my site as well, TracesOfReality.com. Subscribe to TOR via iTunes, RSS feed, all that good stuff. It's free. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter slash TracesOfReality on both of those sites. Okay, now on today's show, my guest today is Vivian Lesnick Wiseman. She's a journalist and documentary filmmaker. Her upcoming film is now titled The Hacker Wars. And if you've been following the project, you know that it was called The Reality Wars up until a short time ago. So we'll talk a little bit about that. The film raises some pressing issues about the the government's crackdown on hacktivists, on activists, journalists. Vivian, thank you so much for being on the program. How are you doing today? Thank you, Guillermo. How are you? I'm doing just fine. It's really good to talk to you. Uh, You know, as I mentioned, you have this new film that you're currently working on and that I'd like to talk about, but uh, I would like to spend a few minutes just getting to know you a little bit uh, and talk about you, talk about maybe even some of your previous films and and your background as a journalist. So if you wouldn't mind sharing just a little bit about yourself, how you got started in journalism and how you uh, got started with filmmaking. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I actually went to law school um, before I went to film school. Um, and my father is a, a legendary journalist, um, so I really grew up around journalism. Uh, he was a Cuban revolutionary, and he left Cuba after the revolution because he uh, didn't want to have a revolution aligned with uh, Moscow. He wanted a non-aligned revolution, not U.S. or Moscow-influenced um, so when he went to Miami, he started a, first a radio show and later a magazine out of the basement of our house. So I grew up around journalism. He, it was actually a really successful um, journalism venture. And uh, he spoke very openly about wanting relations with Cuba. And because of that stance that he took against U.S. policy, um, he became the, the the focal point of the anti-Castro terrorists in the United States. So um, uh, his magazine was bombed 11 times by CIA-trained um, uh, anti-Cuba, anti-Castro, U.S., living in the U.S., um, uh, terrorists. Um, so I really understand, um, you know, advocacy journalism and uh, people who speak truth to power. And so I, that's why I became interested in the hacktivists and in, in the work of, of WikiLeaks, Assange, Bre- uh, um, Barrett Brown, and mm-hmm. of course, uh, Jeremy Hammond and his very principled stand um, for transparency and... and um, and advocacy. Uh, so, it, you know, so it's kind of like we kind of like keep making the same movie over and over again, <laughs> writing, right? It's like kind of like, yeah. so it, journalism, it's in my genes. Um, I didn't study journalism. I went to first law school and la- later to film school. But um, it just kind of, it's something that I, that I do instinctively try right. to expose things that other people aren't looking into. No, and as you mentioned, that's very interesting to find out that this is in your blood and your genes. And your father is, of course, Max Lesnick, for those of you uh, following along at home, <laughs> in case you missed that. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, a Cuban revolutionary, uh, at one time a close friend of Fidel Castro, and, and had a falling out, as you mentioned, as you described. And uh, so this was the basis, I, I think, uh, in reading about you, I found this out, this was the basis of your uh, film, The Man of Two Havanas. 
And yes. uh, you were just talking about the environment uh, in the you know the 1970s and 80s of uh, Miami. And uh, as you as you talked about the CIA's involvement with the training of terrorists, these anti-Castro Cubans, all very very fascinating stuff. That honestly, I need a, a deeper education on this part of our history. I don't know enough about it, and I do plan on checking out your film to to learn more about this. Um, and I'm glad. Yeah. Yeah, and then so, you know, I'm very really interested in hearing about this because, as you mentioned, you know, that's really cool to hear that your father went at this independently, you know, ba- in, in the basement of your house. I mean, I am, I am so down with that, <laughs> yeah. doing this on your own. This is the way that I've chosen to do this. Um, you know, I'm not uh, sponsored by anybody. I, I, I rely on our readers and our listeners to help us out and to keep it going. And so far, so good. So uh, I'm so down with that. That's really cool. Um so, so yeah, let's get into this then. So you talk about how um, I also find it interesting that, that you, as you said, you, you did not go uh, to school for journalism, uh, neither, neither did I, and, and I consider myself yeah. a journalist. And so many of us these days who are involved with independent media and independent journalism uh, just decided to, to do it on our own and just, you know, have a go at it because we, we saw the world around us, whatever it might be, whatever given issue is, is your thing. And we said, you know what? Something needs to be done about this. Why not, you know, enter the fray and, and do this myself and have a say in it, uh, and and you know, and, and therefore, you know, get the message out to the people. I think that's excellent. So you've you've come at these new issues uh, with with hacktivism, activism, and journalism. You mentioned two important names already: uh, Barrett Brown and Jeremy Hammond. Uh, which I, I, I'm sure your your film uh, will go into. So, could you talk about, excuse me, <clears throat> this new film? And uh, and so, people that have been following it again, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, it was called the Reality Wars. And you mentioned to me just now, briefly before we started recording here, that that the name has changed uh, to the Hacker Wars. So, can you can you go into that? Um, this, explain uh, first of all why the name change, and then yes. explain what the what the film is about. Yes, certainly. Well, um, the the original name, the, the movie hasn't changed at all. We're editing, and then we thought, yes, this is about the reality wars. We're just looking at it from different angles. So um, we, I th- the, the, the name, the reality wars, I think, has to do with the names of both of your shows, um, Traces of Reality and um, also your rift on manufacturing consent. Mm-hmm. So... Um, the Reality Wars is the war on our minds by the government, the mainstream media, by those who want to shape how we see the world. Um, and the hackers and the hacktivists, they put a wrench in that because when they expose secrets, they expose caches of emails or they expose client lists of private intelligence contractors and the the corruption and dirty work and the collusion between government, private intelligence contractors and corporations, they are breaking or pulling back the curtain and and exposing what's behind this false reality that we take for truth, Mm. Um, that we, we think that this is the way the world is. But really, these forces, uh, mainstream media, et cetera, what they're doing is it's a psyops on our minds. It's, it's, it's not giving forth information, but it's confusing false information for reality. So that's the original name, which I think is what also I, can, I see is what you're doing mm-hmm. with your two shows, um, trying to get at like what's behind what, they, what the other forces want us right. to think. Is the truth, and I know it completely sounds like science fiction, <laughs> The Matrix. But once you start looking at like what we're supposed to believe is true, and then we see the reality in in revelations, like in the Snowden revelations, um, on the on the, the massive spying in in the Stratford hack on the spying of on activists such as Occupy activists and the Bhopal disaster, which I, I, I'd actually like to get into at least sure. one of those um, revelations of the mm-hmm. Stratford Act. But once you start seeing this, then it no longer sounds like some science fiction movie that you and I are, are cooking up, right? Right, right. <laughs> um, so the change to the Hacker Wars is just a, a spin in the perspective 
um, rather than looking at it from the, the point of view of what's being done to us, the American people, um, in manufacturing realities for us. I'm looking at it from, sorry about that. It's okay. <laughs> I'm looking about, at it from the point of view of what the hackers are doing to fight back. And mm. what we can do to fight back. So that's why it's called the hacker wars. Gotcha. Because it's a, less of a, like a passive, uh, we're the victims and mm. this is done upon us. And more, we're the warriors, the information warriors, the, the hacktivists, the people that can actually change things. And so it's the same movie. It's just that the perspective has shifted. Gotcha. No, that that makes a whole lot of sense, and absolutely, I can I can very much relate to uh, what you're talking about. Indeed, that is uh, basically uh, what I was going for with with the name Traces of Reality, and also as you mentioned with demanufacturing consent is, is just that exactly the way you described it is is challenging the sort of prescribed reality coming at us the 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 sort of uh, narratives that are that are shaped for us the parameters of, de of debate are are shaped for us by you know the the, the either the government the state uh, intelligence uh, big business corporations and they're all in league to create this environment where uh, a certain a, re a reality that they uh, prefer us to <laughs> subscribe to is projected upon the public and it is it, it does it sounds I know like as he just mentioned like something out of the matrix or something which functions as an allegory for what is actually happening in reality so that's yeah. why that's why I guess that that film uh, resonated so much with the public and why a film like V for Vendetta has resonated so much with the public and that why that that image of Guy Fox has been adopted by by Occupy and by Anonymous Yes. Um, there's a reason for that, and so uh, absolutely, I completely concur with with your analysis of this sort of psyop uh, uh, happening, uh, you know, generally uh, with through media, through the information, through the you know misinformation and disinformation and all that stuff. So very, very interesting to hear you talk about this, and also I find it interesting that you found that to be uh, at least with the, with your film. Uh, and that perspective to be a, a sort of a, a victim mentality, because it's something that I've talked about a lot on the program, is that's something that I actively try to combat, because I understand that by talking about so much bad news and talking about how we're being surveilled and talking about how our phones are being tapped and all that stuff, you know, you can go down the laundry list of the NDAA, for crying out loud, and so many different things, um, okay. that, com that can become... A little overwhelming, and the listener, uh, the sort of consumer of this information, can can come to feel hopeless and helpless. And oh my God, it's so it's all gone to hell. And what am I going to do about it? Nothing. And you can develop, <laughs> you know, right? You can develop the sort of victim uh, mentality and this passivity to to our relationship with what's what's happening all around us. We become observers instead of active participants. And so I actively try and to 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 speak that message and say. Do not feel that way. I really hope that in, in doing this show, I am not, uh, uh, you know, uh, providing or, or helping uh, for that for that sort of mentality to further develop. I, I really dislike that, <laughs> and so I, I right. hope that that that. And I th so I feel that that by taking a different perspective with this film, perhaps that is a very very good idea. Not perhaps I think it's a good idea, and perhaps it will have a, a, a better effect, and it will be uh, received in a different way. Um, to look at you know the ways that we can uh, affect the system, the way we can challenge it and create change. And I do feel that hacktivism definitely has its place in this. It is, after all, the the new front in this in this. I don't know what you want to call it, but I know what Keith Alexander and Michael Hayden would call it. They're calling this you know cyber war is the next front, and they're saying anonymous is the next Al Qaeda, and hacktivists are should be treated like terrorists, and they all this nonsense. And they're really sort of painting this picture, I think, and setting it up so that they can blame potentially some kind of event, say a power grid goes down or something. So, you know, you know I, wars are begun on false pretenses all the time, and that really worries me that they can, in a way, in the future, try to pin this on uh, on hacktivism and hacktivists. And, and so we've seen this already so much. Go ahead. They're setting the stage for right. that. And, I mean, most wars, or recent wars anyway, are based on on false flags i mean right. it, it's just 
it's kind of the culmination of these reality wars, if you will. Um, I, 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 I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy to hear that you agree with, with the shift in, in the name, which is the shift in perspective. Uh, part of it was watching the film as we're editing, but un- another part of it is as I talk to people, um, like, like people, like in my family, even, um, they feel like, okay, so this is true, and now what? Right, right. So, with the spying and all that. So, and that they can't change anything. And so, the point of view of the movie is, like, you may not be able to change anything, but if you, but if you don't try to change things, you're a slave. I mean, mm. the whole idea of resistance is an end in itself. Um, and I think that that the hacktivists um, and activists um, are really, well, the hackers are the, the last front. I mean, I really, in, in the film, I think that these are the people that are at the forefront that are not deterred. They're not afraid. Um, and the people that I that I cover in the film, which is kind of like our heroes, they're anti-heroes, um, like Hammond and Brown, uh, and Weave also in his own way. Weave, the hacker that didn't hack AT and T, the infamous internet troll. He's part right. of the film yeah. as well. Um, he basically the whole. Well, I'll just cover Weave quickly. Basically, the whole pet community is in agreement, including the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Stanford University, Mozilla, Firefox, that he is imprisoned for a non-crime. He basically data mined, he aggregated uh, one, uh, he created a program, and then he 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 that spelled um, email addresses, and he gave them to a journalist. So sure was he that he wasn't breaking any laws that he. Uh, a credit for it and gave it to a journalist at Gawker to publish and Weave is doing four years in jail um, because he had the audacity to embarrass a multinational corporation, AT&T. Um, he, he's probably going to overturn the CFAA. Um, not that that's going to fix anything because uh, we live in a in, in in right now in a country that can just create other laws. You know, if we oh, we've overturned the CFAA is the hacking law. There is no other hacking law. Um, so if the day they overturn the CFAA, you can hack everything because there is no. <laughs> right. So, yeah. um, but um, governments that like the United States that are in decline and 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 feel insecure. Um, because of the economic crisis, because of impending maybe environmental disasters, they just create laws. I mean, like the one you mentioned, like NDAA and the indefinite detention laws. Um, those are uh, I mean, nothing that that uh, governments like to use a really like the the over the top example uh the the Nazi Germany nothing they did was illegal they had laws in place right. to justify everything being done and we're making laws that are completely um a shift away a a, a sea change from the types of laws that we had even 10 years ago um and clearly after 911 mm-hmm. um so I feel like I'm I'm talking about too many subjects. No, at once. not at not at all. Because I, those, those all these subjects relate, and they're all very important. And I, I do want to get into. Uh, you mentioned one specific example that I was going to ask you, and that was Weave. But there are uh, I, would, I do want to get into the details of the Hammond case. Uh, we yes. talked about Barrett Brown on the show previously, but it's oh, worth okay. it's worth mentioning because uh, it does relate. Before we go into that specifically, though, I want I just have one last quick question about yes. a general question because this is still on my mind. So I was recording a podcast. 
podcast uh, yesterday with a couple of friends of mine, uh, uh, Sec- Tom Secker and, and James Corbett, who people listening to the show uh, know well. <laughs> so I thought I'd mention that. But uh, we did talk about Anonymous a little bit, and it came up, so it's still on my mind. I want to ask you this because I know people who are listening to this who are more uh, uh, discerning listeners, who are perhaps a, a touch more cynical than perhaps I am. Uh, they they do uh, look at something like Anonymous. And they think, well, wait, what if Anonymous is in itself a PSYOP? What if this is in itself a controlled opposition, right? Those questions have been raised. So I'd like to get your opinion on that because, you know, the way I see it and the way I think that that this is uh, sort of uh, disproven is that Anonymous isn't anything that can be identifiable. It's an amorphous group. These are individuals who sort of do their own thing and identify under the common banner of Anonymous, but they are an amorphous group. And I think that by examining these individual cases, like a, like a Jeremy Hammond, for example, then we can come to learn how there are individuals uh, who uh, at one time or another, I guess, considered themselves to be a part of this amorphous group, Anonymous, who are doing genuine work in trying to uh, show what is actually happening behind the scenes. So your opinion on that, uh, uh, Vivian? Just, oh, sure. yeah. um, well, is, is the reasoning that that anonymous uh, could be government created. Be, uh, to what end? To right. to in order right. to you know my. I mean, it, it, I I don't actually know what the answer is. To what end? In order to close down the internet? I mean, what is the? What are the different? Um, hmm. Potentially, uh, I suppose that that I guess that could be uh, one possible uh, theory as to why that could be could be done. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, possibly to because uh, we know you know for example. Obviously, something like this can be infiltrated. That that that's a, I think is a given. We learned that through COINTELPRO. That oh, right. Sure. So I mean, that's that's a certainty. But I, I suppose that there are people who think that that uh, it was from start to finish some kind of government op for whatever end. I mean, what's your general take on that? Well, I'm assuming they don't mean it was a go- a government op all the way when from B Chan. Or like, how? When does it become a government right. op? Right? right. No, I see what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know. Um, Couldn't it be infiltrated? Can it be used? Um, I mean, Jeremy Hammond attested to that mm. uh, in his closing statement when he was sentenced. I mean, I don't want to start at the end, but right, just, right. just quickly, he said he asked when Jeremy Hammond took his very principal stand and he faced. Judge Preska, who was about to sentence him and had the ability um, to sentence him to time served, meaning he could go home, and up to 10 years, he took that opportunity to do something which would have guaranteed him the top of the guidelines, and he did indeed get full 10 years, which is that he uh, did not show any, um, he did not, he, sh- he took uh, uh, he he took the position that mm. what he had done was right. No remorse, in other words, right? No remorse, mm-hmm. and and even I would say that he would do it again. Yeah. So yeah, physicism as well. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, I was there, and everyone that was there was inspired by what he said. But but getting back to what you just mentioned as to whether anonymous is a psyop. Um, he said that sub, the informant that we all, you know, your viewer, your listeners may or may probably know, but I, I'm not sure exactly right. what your universe is. Sabu, who mm-hmm. was an elite hacker and created Antisec, that's uh, an offshoot of Anonymous, uh, which was a honeypot for hackers, and that is the, uh, the way... Uh, um, Hammond was entrapped was through this, you know, government created crime. Um, so uh, he, Jeremy Hammond at sentencing said that he was taking responsibility for his actions and it was time that the government took responsibility for their actions because he had been asked through Sabu, and every time we say Sabu, Hector Monsegur, um, we should we can say we can use the word the government or the FBI right. mm-hmm. or the state 
or but the U.S. government used Anon's anonymous used Jeremy Hammond to hack into secure foreign government websites, and he listed them. He started trying to list them, Brazil, um, Iran, and then he was stopped. And there's a protective order not allowing him to list the governments that he wow. personally had uh, uh, had invaded at the government's bequest. So clearly the government is doing something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, why would they use hackers uh, and not government hackers um, to break into these websites knowing that someone like Hammond could reveal it later? I mean, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Um, it's certainly not because it's cheaper to use uh, rogue hackers that you're going to arrest, arrest sure. out. Yeah. That. Um, uh, Jeremy says yeah. because they're better, uh, they're kind of, I mean, there must be some that are at least almost as good as Jeremy, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I would think. But, I mean, it is an interesting question because, I mean, uh, clearly... Uh, you know, based on uh, Hammond's uh, past, uh, what he said, his statements, he's the genuine article, right? He was doing this for principled reasons, which is why uh, he is considered by by you and a lot of people a political prisoner, uh, myself included. Uh, yes. He was doing this for for political, for uh, principled reasons is why he hacked Stratford. And I, we haven't mentioned that. We went up, as you mentioned earlier, we went kind of backwards on this, but that's okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but the interesting thing is, though, do, do, with his statement at the end there dur during sentencing, we did learn that the government did use him. Uh, a, gen a person who was genuine in his motivations initially was used by Sabu, which is, as you said, interchangeable with the FBI or the government, uh, was used to hack the, gov the, the governments of foreign countries, uh, the systems of foreign countries. And once they were, in a way, I suppose, done with him, he was someone that was disposable and in the eyes of the state, right? Someone that they could use, someone who had uh, conviction and was going to do it for his reasons. They used him and then disposed of him and sent him up the river, so to speak, for, for 10 years. Um, and sadly, this is not a, a sort of a tried and true method that has been used, again, since the days of COINTELPRO, infiltrating activist groups, uh, uh, radicalizing, say, uh, the, the Black Panthers, for example, uh, using them for whatever purpose, and then disposing of them, and, 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 and sometimes quite literally disposing of them by killing them. That was, the, that was what COINTELPRO, that's, the, that's the, the, the dark side of COINTELPRO that isn't talked about as much, because most people talk about it in, in, in the ways that it was infiltrated to discredit or to, uh, to arrest or what have you. Part of it was actually to flat out murder people, which was crazy, but it happened. I've said this a ton of times, and I'll say it again. Google the name Fred Hampton. It'll open your eyes to what COINTELPRO was actually about. In fact, episode one of this podcast was all about that with my good friend Larry Pinkney, who was a, a, a former uh, Black Panther himself, original Black Panther Party. Not the new one. Big difference. But anyway, uh, going off on a tremendous tangent. Now, <laughs> coming back to Hammond, though. Can you tell us, uh, I guess let's start at the beginning now, because I think this is an important case. So what exactly uh, did Hammond do? Um, what uh, were, I suppose, the, the what, what came out of uh, his activism, his, his hacktivism, were the things that we learned? And you, you touched on a couple of them uh, earlier, the Occupy and uh, the activists in India, uh, and ultimately what he was charged with and, and all that stuff. So kind of give us the a more complete uh, picture of, of Jeremy Hammond. Okay, yes. Okay, so Jeremy's a really interesting case because when I went to meet him and I interviewed him when he was incarcerated um, a couple of months ago, I expected, I knew he had a background in activism, uh, boots on the ground, because I had been to Chicago and I had spoken to, he's from Chicago, he's a very well-known, beloved activist from Chicago, um, and his his brother, uh, he has a twin brother that lives there, and Jeremy's very well known in the group that is referred to as Black Bloc, so Black Bloc actions, he participates in that. He's a very well known anarcho-communist. He has read a lot of books and he's very schooled in anarchism. Uh, but a new brand of anarchism, even though he's read all the books, he's not an ideologue. Hmm. He really believes in the type of 
you know, I met a lot of anarchists like this in Chicago, which are just people that don't really, aren't going to wait around for, gov for the government to help them. They just help each other. It's people to people, neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, and so they feel, you know, the government fails people in a lot of ways. And it's really going back to traditional, you know, people helping their neighbors mm -hmm. and helping feed people and sharing child care and, you know, just this really um, hum humane and human-based um, philosophy of life. Um, and he, But he also, uh, in addition to that, uh, uses black bloc tactics. Uh, in, or, in other words, he uses um, vandalism and uh, destruction of property, etc., um, in, in ways uh, to, you know, in different ways. It's just using a diversity of tactics in order to have I mean, this man is a revolutionary. He has, uh, he knows what, he, he believes in ideals, and he's nothing but uh, he, but an idealist. I mean, he really believes that the world can be a better place, um, and he has no illusions about bloodless revolution. He does, he really feels that the world has gotten, well, that there's a lot of, you know, suffering, but it's mm -hmm. just disproportionately spread throughout the economic spectrum. Right. And that there's a lot of people already living in dire, dire, you know, hungry. That, that, that euphemism, food insecurity, I mean, isn't it just like a reality war? <laughs> right. <laughs> what does that even mean? Mm. Like, you know, a lot of people that are, that go to bed hungry and, and he's, he's going to do everything within his power to change the system um, uh, so that that kind of inhumanity and that kind of disparity doesn't exist. Um, so I had met, like, I knew that, but going in, because of my movie, I was very prepared to see someone who would tell me that, you know, hack, because, you know, the movie's about, like, hackers are going to save the world. They're our last hope. <laughs> uh, so... I was prepared to meet someone that was going to say, like, I asked him questions like, is, you know, does activism uh, really work in the technological age without the added threat of, of, of hacking? And he completely set me straight. Jeremy is an activist first. Mm. Um, and he only, and he sees hacking or hacktivism as one more direct action tool. So no different from any direct action, no difference from a black bloc action. He sees it as just one more in the diversity of tactics to utilize when you're trying to uh, bring down a system. Excellent. So I was very uh, taken aback, and then mm -hmm. I then I got, um, and he he has a a very captivating way of um, taking you in. Um, and so I can really see how it might have been important to remove him, hmm. uh, to target him, and to remove him from his um, from his stomping ground. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, Indeed, that's happened uh, as we've just described over and over and over again. They they do target by they I mean FBI and and yes. intelligence agencies things like this. They do tend to target individuals. Uh, who can, uh, in, I, say, I guess, rally the troops, so to speak, and, and do have that sort of uh, way about them. Uh, in fact, not to, not to go back to this too much, but that's something that, that Larry Pinkney shared with me uh, specifically, that that was actually in his FBI file, that they were going to go after him because he has a, uh, I think it was something like a natural uh, talent to unite, basically. <laughs> and those are the kinds of people that they don't like. Um, and I suppose Hammond fit that description. Well, he fits the description, and also you mentioned uh, the Black Panthers and Fred Hampton. Mm -hmm. um, the, this, the Chicago principles, you know, the mm. the, the, the mantra of uh, of the Black Panthers, which basically the part I'm referring to yeah. is that activists shouldn't criticize other activists right. in public. In or, or air their dirty laundry and the dissensions within the inner workings of the group in public, 
you know, one common enemy. And uh, what, uh, what, uh, I mean, that is clearly not practiced um, in the movements and the social movements that we have today. Sure, yeah. Especially, in, I mean, and I'm thinking about online movements, and I'm thinking about the, the, the moral fags versus the lulz fags and all of the permutations, mm -hmm. of all of the activists, including outing of the black bloc from the Occupy movement, etc. So it's really interesting because um, Jeremy, we didn't, we didn't specifically talk about the Chicago principles, but um, I he every person that I asked him about, no matter where they were on the political spectrum, as long as they were against the system or wanting to reform the system, and he corrected me, I'm not a reformer, he said. So he, he stands by his idea of revolution. Mm. He will not take anything less than that. He doesn't believe the system can reform itself. Um, but at the same time, anyone who's using any type of uh, channels uh, that is going to reform the system, he will not criticize. He lives by those principles. Now you, you, and I'm, you know, having been immersed in this online activism world, I mean, everybody is I mean, this is co-intel pro, but mm -hmm. they don't see it. I mean, this is, everyone is against everyone else. And, what, and it's, you know, it, it, it takes on all sorts of permutations, but basically this movement is just beginning, but at the same time, is it even a movement when there's so much dissension and there's so much outing, um, you know, amongst the people? Yeah, this is cla I mean, classic divide and conquer tactics. This, if if indeed this is what's going on, I mean, that's pretty pretty basic stuff. Um, and it's unfortunate that 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 realization has not reached uh, more of these groups yet, and uh, they, they don't adopt that same uh, sort of logic and rationale that. Uh, and I, can't, I keep I keep saying I keep bringing up Larry, but that's something he's he has said to me so many times. Exactly oh, wow. what you just said that you know, you know we disagree <laughs> in the closet. Uh, uh, that's something I think he uh, he's always quoting a uh, 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 Malcolm X. He said you disagree in the closet, but when you come out, uh, you have a united front. You know, uh, and so that's something he's always always said. So uh, Which is what happened with WikiLeaks and Julian Assange? Right, this is a perfect example right. of. I mean, he. I mean, I've had conversations with people that are big hacktivist uh, supporters and important supporters of Bradley Manning. Um, and they, you know, they, they've they actually argued with me that, that Assange didn't introduce the leaking culture because Cryptome existed before Assange. Mm -hmm. Well, but nobody leaked to Cryptome. Bradley Manning didn't leak to Cryptome, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, um yeah, so it, it's it's a bit of a mess. Yeah. Uh, well, let's let's get into the the stuff that that the Hammond right. What he, what came out of the the, the the hacking, the hacktivism of Jeremy Hammond, the the sort of revelations that came out of that Stratford hack. Well, as you know, the Stratford hack revelations um, uh, are on WikiLeaks as uh, the global intelligence files. Mm -hmm. So um, we the uh, Hammond. It was an epic hack by all counts. So he leaked 5.2 million emails, uh, something like 860,000 um, Strat4 subscriber clients and 60,000 credit cards, unencrypted credit cards. So um, what was Strat4? Strat4 is this public, uh, it's a Sorry, a private intelligence contractor that contracts with the government. Mm -hmm. So the at the meta level, the one of the important things is that there had been H.B. Gary before, but really with Stratford, we start hearing about in the in the media about these what is a private intelligence contractor. And then when you dig a little deeper, you see that. 70% of American intelligence is outsourced. It's a Tim Sherratt. That's his um, statistic. And what does that even mean? Well, that means that the, in, that the CIA is this little quaint 
uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> agency because they only do about 30% of intelligence. Hmm. So uh, this is a shadow CIA type of organization that has absolutely no congressional oversight, no oversight of any kind, and their um, allegiance is to their board of directors, which, which like any corporation, it's uh, doing its job when it's maximizing profit. So what kind of things would private intelligence contractors do when they start gathering intelligence? Well, clearly it's more profitable to them when there's a lot of conflict and a lot of high stakes and a lot of danger. So how do we even know that anything they're presenting, that their intelligence is actually uh, 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 honest if their profit motive is, is, is tantamount to everything else? Um, I mean, to me, that, that's actually extremely important. Uh, now, so he hacks into Stratfor um, and he uploads to WikiLeaks. Uh, and who starts looking at stuff? Well, actually, it didn't get a lot of play in the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. um, but we've had certain journalists at certain places that are studying it. Um, and slowly we're trying, we're, we're getting into like what exactly. And it's just a gold mine. I mean, we don't even. We don't, it's not even the tip of the iceberg, but some of the things that came out is that Stratford was was um, the, the the client list. So the client list reads like a who's who of America right. of American corporations, basically the corporate state, the people that run things. Um, so we've got Coca Cola, we've got um, a Bank of America, mm -hmm. we've got Dow Chemical. Um, and then the revelations. So they spied on Occupy. Um, they tried to set up independent journalist Alexa O'Brien. Try to link her to fundamental. She's a Alexa O'Brien is, a, is a, a journalist that's become well known because she transcribed every day Bradley, Bradley Manning, Manning trial. trial. Right. Right. So she's a very well respected journalist. She's won a lot of awards. And the mainstream media that set out the majority of the Bradley Manning proceedings would have no information unless she had been uh, transcribing everything. So, uh, by the way, real this, quick, just to inject this, because I think I believe I read that Alexa O'Brien is now uh, auctioning off that transcript of the Manning trial, and all the proceeds are going to go towards uh, Barrett Brown's defense. So, I just wanted to throw that out there for people listening. Yes, this is a historic document. Um, she's auctioning the the actual the pleadings. Mm -hmm. The um, and uh, I, I was looking at it. It's all handwritten. It it, it it's very very precious. This document. Um, it's very meaningful, and we'll see. You know, in who who's the highest bidder? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, so so I I would like to just focus on one revelation sure. because if focus on them all um i think we'll lose the yeah we'll we'll fill up way too much time to, <laughs> and it's a, okay. it's a lot and it's a lot to uh to absorb also for the for the listeners so yeah absolutely whatever you think is is probably um a sort of uh, the, the 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 one that you think people should really be paying attention to right now well to me one that i'm I'd like to talk about right now mm -hmm. is um, Dow Chemical was a, is, is a client of Stratfor, and Dow Chemical has never taken responsibility for its subsidiary Union Carbide in something that's known as the Bhopal disaster, mm -hmm. which is a, a a chemical spill that killed initially forty thousand um, Indians in Bhopal, India. Um, but even though they didn't take responsibility for that, they were spying on the Bhopal activists. Now, in addition to the 4,000 people, over 500,000 people, Indians in India, have been affected by that disaster. Union Carbide Dow Chemical has never cleaned that. They've never taken responsibility for it, and they've never cleaned it up. So the, the, the documents um, reveal that Dow Chemical 
in the midst of this $100 million sponsorship of the Olympics um, in India, took an interest in the Bhopal disaster and the activists and what they were doing because it might hurt their branding, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so we have 4,000 dead people that died overnight in this disaster and 500,000 in the interim since this disaster which happened in 1984 that have become severely ill. Never took responsibility, never paid a penny to the victims. But yet, they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, gathering intelligence, gathering information on the victims. Right. right. On 25 years later, they're gathering information. In other words, like this cover-up. Stratford's helping them cover up what they've never taken responsibility for. Well, if if they had no responsibility, why would they be spying and gathering intelligence on the activists that are trying to right a wrong? I mean, this, what a what a, a reversal of of the way the world should work. Yeah. We should be protecting people that have come under that that are victims of disasters. Um, and and so I would and, add real quick, also protecting the individuals who uh, uncover this information, like like a Hammond, which is why this case is so important and why, uh, as you just said, everything is just on its head. We're living in bizarro world where the guy who uh, shared with the world this information that you're sharing with uh, with our audience right now, the guy who, who discovered it through his activism is now going to jail for 10 years, and the big criminals, the Dow Chemical uh, or Stratford themselves or whoever, you know, these guys or the government, you know, whatever, these guys, they what 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 punishment do they receive? None, if, if any at all, maybe a, a tiny fine that, that's a, a tiny, tiny percentage of their of their profits every year. It's, it's just really, again, uh, I- I- incredible that this is the, the world that we live in today, isn't it? Yeah, well, you know, some the reason I'm talking about Bhopal is because someone two days ago posted on my Facebook page a picture of an Indian, right? She's clearly an Indian with a bindi on, in between her forehead. Um, oh, I saw this on your Twitter feed. In a sari, holding a picture of Jeremy Hammond. Mm. In India, in Bhopal, Jeremy Hammond is a hero because he brought to light an injustice being done against people, victims of, of Union Carbide. Indeed. And in the United States, in Judge Preska's court in New York City, he's sentenced to 10 years. I mean, that's so, that is such a reality war on our minds. Exactly. I mean, and what a powerful image that was of, the, of, of that young girl holding up a picture of Hammond saying, free Hammond. Uh, what a what a message that that sends because again you know this is a I know I can see now why uh, it, you know the reality war was the your name of choice in the in the in the beginning because it, it really is that it really is that that war on, on on perception on reality on our minds because how how can this be you know you know I have to say just quickly as so we're, yeah. we're running short on time yeah, yeah. it's it's a shame that uh, I don't know if you saw the story about Ethan Couch because if you go if you go to any of your recent articles. Uh, Vivian on Huffington yes. Post, um, yes. right? You know, next to it, I couldn't avoid looking at it just now because under most popular is a story, and I, I, you might have seen it by now. It says teen avoids prison because he's wealthy. The story of Ethan Couch. Have you seen this? It's no, I oh my god! It's a, I mean, I was going to say it's a shame that Jeremy Hammond or Barrett Brown weren't extremely wealthy, or they would have just gotten probation instead of you know ten years or one hundred and five years potentially. Because this this I can't. I sh- it's just kind of a tangent, but it's not. It's still it relates in this way that uh, here is a, a young boy, sixteen years old, um, who argued his, his lawyer argued he had affluenza. Meaning he's too rich to have a moral compass. So oh, wow. he he was uh, driving around drunk, killed four people. Four people uh, are no longer alive because of this uh, young man's actions. And he gets probation. Whereas, again, I mean, juxta- juxtapo- uh, juxtaposition that with Jeremy Hammond, who hacked into Stratford and got some emails. Barrett Brown, who linked, <laughs> put up a link to uh, uh, these emails. And they're they're seeing they're gonna they're potentially seeing a hard time 
versus a guy who killed four people and gets probation. This is the world we live in. It's just it's just incredible. I'm sorry that I had to throw that in there. No, I just wanted to bring that no. up. I think that's interesting because see this young man suffering from affluenza. He killed four people, and that does not in any way threaten the state for dead people. Mm. But uh, Aaron Swartz, who was also an affluent young man, he threatened the state mm, with his good point. activism. Good point. And he thought he was a. But Aaron never thought that was going to happen to him. Aaron thought that he was, you know, friends with the <laughs> you know, the, the, the Digirati and and Lawrence Lessig. And, yeah, yeah. And that he, but but the but he wasn't too big for the machine to devour. There no one. Is. Mm-hmm threaten the state you have to like pass like the the billion dollar mark i guess you know david coke would never go to jail <laughs> <laughs> no that's a really really good point i mean yeah this young kid whose parents are very very wealthy and which i found ironic that the 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 the, the legal defense was he's too he's too he's so rich that he thinks his actions don't have consequences and so therefore his actions shouldn't have consequences it's i that's thought it's yeah so, but but but, it's like, but, but good but point I, though that he's not a threat though is he to the state yeah, I'm like, I'm to see how that would work because, like, you know, we could go down the line of the people responsible for these illegal, arguably illegal wars, and they've got like paruenza, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> you don't see Dick Cheney or any of those guys going to jail either. Exactly. No, they they host banquets and and have a good laugh at our expense and joke about how they're eating and, 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 and enjoying fine dining instead of uh, instead of being uh, at the Hague where they should be. Literally, they, yeah. that's what they were joking about. It's quite, again, it's just, it is yeah. freaking bizarro land. It's, so Guillermo, like, we, it's the hacker wars because it's way too depressing to talk about <laughs> how they're doing all Very true. Us, right? <laughs> very, it's very a, true. The film is like a, you know, like a recruitment video, like the be the best that you can be, join the army. Well, okay, so you could just, you know, labor in your <laughs> minimum wage job that you can, can't even get hmm. anymore. Or you could like join this movement and, and fight the good fight. Indeed. Well, Vivian, I know you've got to run, uh, so we're, all, we're just about out of time. But uh, if anything else you'd like to share with the audience real quick before you go, uh, please do mention, uh, for example, where people listening out there can learn more about the film, can follow your work, things like this, please. Okay. Well, I guess that I, today I've been working all day on our presentation. Um, some of us are going, my, my film has a panel at the South by Southwest Festival, which is in March. And I'm super excited about it because that South by Southwest is in Austin, Texas. Yeah, I'm just so, south of Austin. Maybe I'll see you there. You should come because the panel's about Barrett Brown and about Jeremy Hammond. And as you know, and maybe your listeners know, Barrett Brown is incarcerated in Texas and there's a mm-hmm. gag order. We're going to be talking up a storm about his case. And Stratfor is in Texas, Indeed, too. in Austin, Texas. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's going to be super fun, you know, to bring the mountain is going to Mohammed. Um, and uh, uh, I guess the film, you know, we're just, uh, we, we have a website, but it's all going to be new with the new name. Right. So just, you know, you can follow me on Twitter. And I just use at Vivian Wiseman. Um, and... Uh, and we'll be in touch. Excellent. Sounds good. No, I, I, I hope that we can keep in touch. And uh, I do plan on, on, you know, I haven't been to South by Southwest since I lived in Austin like seven years ago, maybe four or five years ago. Uh, and it's changed a lot since then. But I do plan on going to this one. I did hear about that panel and a couple other ones that I found interesting. So I, I do plan on making it a point to at least attempt to make it a make a visit out to, to Austin. Okay, stuff. I'm sure. a bunch of there. <laughs> yeah, so again, uh, f- follow Vivian uh, Lesnick Wiseman at Vivian Wiseman on Twitter to find out more details about what is happening with this panel, with the film. Uh, the website for the film currently is therealitywars.com, but as Vivian just mentioned, yes. uh, that will be changing very soon with the new title and all that good stuff. So be sure and follow that for all the latest, and I'll be probably t- tweeting about it myself so you guys know where to find me. Uh, again, Vivian, been a pleasure to talk to you. 
Big thank thanks. You so much, Ian. You're going to have an amazing show. Thank you. Thank you again. And thank you to the audience for listening. Thank you for subscribing to BFP and keeping this show and many other good shows on BFP alive. Very, very much appreciate that support. Come back and join us next week right here on Demanufacturing Consent. Until then, this has been your host, Guillermo Jimenez, reminding you, as always, that on this grand chessboard, it is we, the people who are now in check. It's our move. Thank you all for listening. Thank <laughs> you.